everything <coughs> in Sahaja Yoga is very scientific, uh, is all pre-planned, I think, and is all significant. For example, today is Wednesday and we have never had any puja on a Wednesday because I was born on Wednesday. So I was thinking if the puja starts before twelve o'clock, we'll be able to manage it because I was born at twelve. So every child has to sleep after twelve o'clock. So I couldn't, I had to sleep. So it's so significant, you see. It's the first time we are having a puja on Wednesday. Normally I don't even travel on Wednesdays. So you can imagine that it's such a breakthrough and I'm very happy <coughs> that you all are ready for a puja and <coughs> that we could break this rule also after such a long time. <laughs> because <coughs> it was impossible for me to keep awake after twelve years. I was trying, trying, trying. And I knew that you all also feeling very sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so mutual and it's so simple. <coughs> all right. So today we have gathered really remarkably in the really center of the Nabi of the universe. And I don't know how far I can go with the description of this great country <coughs> which we call as Greece. Also <coughs> in the Puranas is de described as Manipur Edvipi. The Manipur is the Mahabhi Chakra. Manipur. And a dweep means the island. Island of the Manipura stays the Athena. And <coughs> there is a temple of Athena all being described <coughs> about her temple, about her uh, jewelry, dress and everything. So it's already in the Puranas described is Athena. As I've told you before, Athena means the primordial mother. So now <coughs> one may say that why the primordial mother Adi Shakti should be on the Nabi chakra of the universe? One may ask a question like that. That why she is placed on the <coughs> Nabi chakra? Because in the remaining way, before the creation was created in the material form, <coughs> where it was planned, then there was something of the what we call is the Vishnu Loka, is the Loka or the area where Vishnu ruled. And in that Vishnu Loka it was decided that Adi Shakti should first come in the form as a <coughs> cow and then she should descend in the area called as Gokul, which is Vishuddhi Chakra first and uh, create vibrations there. Now in the material form the Gokul was where Sri Krishna lived in his childhood. So in the material form Athena itself lived in the material form. I am not saying in the formation before. In this area to create the vibrations. So it is not only she was a goddess, but she lived in this area to create the vibrations for the Nabi, to create the universal compassion and love and all her qualities. 
Now, as you know, every uh, aspect of the goddess has different qualities. And as you can see that Mahakali has the aspect of comforting and Maha Saraswati is counselling. And <coughs> the Mahalakshmi has got for the redemption, for the awakening. But the Adi Shakti's work is to unite everything, to integrate everything. And to integrate all those qualities, the Adi Shakti herself was in material form came on this earth, in this part. And that's why they knew about Athena. But as it is, I don't know what are the stories they have, they must be have some mythological stories about Athena, that she lived like this or whatever it was. And this is the where she created the Devaloka. Devaloka is the area where Devas were created. Like she created Indra, you have heard the name of Indra, then Varuna, all these Devalokas she created in this area, <coughs> not in India. Devaloka was created on this side. And Ganas and all these people were created on the side of Nepal and all those places, on the left hand side. Now, unfortunately, after Socrates, who came here <coughs> in such a uh, condition when people were really absolutely ignorant, in the complete darkness of ignorance, they could not understand him. They could not understand Socrates at all. And so, like any other primordial master was treated uh, by the people who were surrounding him, he was also very much ill-treated and nobody listened to him. But of course, as you know, he was primordial master and his wisdom is well known. And <coughs> he created out of him disciples, but none of them could go anywhere near his wisdom. And they started their own theories, own styles. And that's how we find the accent from the philosophy that was Socrates' aim gradually came into political and then into economic side. So the attention was moved from philosophy to economics today, not towards the philosophy which was established by Socrates. We can say Socrates was the one primordial master <coughs> after Abraham and Moses who really <coughs> made it very clear-cut uh, understanding about spirituality. Of course, Moses and Muhammad, uh, Abraham had different problems, like Abraham had problems of uh, talking to people who were really very, very ignorant. And Moses had problem with people who were very indulgent people. So he had to pass laws of Sharia. Moses passed the law of Sharia. And if you read Bible in the, I think in the first verse only it is written about Sharia. Uh, in the Irmaya, uh, third, uh, third book of Bible, that Moses had to pass these laws, different, different laws, to make people follow religion precisely. So he did not argue. <coughs> he did not say why you should do it, didn't give an answer, you do it like that. Because he thought these people are so ignorant that you cannot leave it to their freedom, <coughs> that uh, you understand this or uh, uh, that you see the point. He could not do that. Way. So he just said, all right, these are the laws, these are the things, and you have to follow. If you don't follow, then you will be killed, your hands will be cut, this will happen, that way. Because the people were of that time. 
Now then you see how gradually at the time of Socrates people had you know, evolved. They were much better people. So he could talk to them about something of wisdom, of honesty, of righteousness, of peace, of so many things he talked and he could talk because people were worthy of that. Otherwise <coughs> he could have said, all right, you do this, you do that, you do that. But see the difference also in the circumstances how what has happened. In the first circumstances when Abraham had problems, then the people were absolutely good for nothing absolutely good for nothing, so he didn't know what to do with them. So only you can see if in the time of Abraham that his own lifestyle is... I mean that was just the system where the family was building up and the relationships were building up and he tried to work it on that level. <coughs> then at the time of Moses people evolved much more. They evolved, but still very ignorant. So they evolved to this point that he did not have to talk the things that Abraham talked. So he talked to them about getting out of Egypt, taking their freedom, getting out from there <coughs> and going to a place of uh, more tranquility. But when they did that, he found these people on the way when he went to get the Ten Commandments, when he came back, what he finds? Are you sure this is what you... Oh. Yes, must be somewhere. It's all right, it's upside down. I think people have issued this. <coughs> Keep it. So the people who were at the time of Moses, uh, when he had gone to get the Ten Commandments, started indulging into very, very immoral character, extremely immoral character. They were very immoral and were doing such horrible things that, that nobody can believe <coughs> that anybody who tried to escape from the Egyptians were worse than the Egyptians themselves. So he gave this chariot to them to change. Now then came the time when people were... I mean, despite all that, people were not so good, we can say, at the time of Christ, but they were not so immoral they also could not understand Christ. So, you see, the, despite all the human evolution, the human awareness evolving, the understanding <coughs> about spirituality was very poor and you could not talk to them. Now, you can also see the circumstances of things. When the circumstances are such, like at the time of, say, Moses, that people are extremely immoral, they are doing all kinds of bad things, they are not bothered about their own destruction. <coughs> the incarnations had to move absolutely to the right because they were so left-sided so the incarnations had to move absolutely to the right and say that if you do like this, this will have to do, the violence part. So they took to violence. So the circumstances made the re reactions of the people. Also the awareness of human beings. So many things worked it out. Say, for example, when Athena came on this earth, her job was to create a integrated force. It 
which will have the whole Chaitanya spread like an integrated force. <coughs> so that when it will be all disintegrated later on, it can integrate. So the Greeks have a job, special job, is to integrate. You have to integrate people which are left-sided and right-sided. And that's what I asked him, what happened to Hitler. So they said that when they saw Hitler, though Hitler respected them, they resisted Hitler. You can see the significance. How he respected the Greeks. And despite that, they resisted him because they were given the special capacity. Same thing with Greeks, they went to, I mean, except Alexander only the war, who tried to invade India. <coughs> and because of a Greek nature, he resisted back. You see, it's a Greek nature that they can go so far and then not, because they have an integrating force. The same thing as I was asking him about what happened with the Turks. They had gone into Tur Turkey, but they receded back. So this power of receding back and is the integrating power by you integrate within yourself both the qualities of the left and right and you balance it and you see now, that's all right. If you have to be in the center, we should go up to point and come back. And this is a very basic quality of Greeks in every respect. If you take their shipping, they're very aggressive in shipping to begin with, extremely aggressive people and Greek ships were known for not maintaining at all. They were not very law-abiding. So they were never used to maintain their ships, you see. And uh, <laughs> always under trouble, the Greeks. That um, the shipping they were known to be, the Greeks are ships which are all falling off, you see, <laughs> and rattling. So <coughs> perhaps, perhaps, they were aware that now the shipping is going to go down, so no use maintaining these ships, you see. Then when, when the shipping went down, you see, this is on an economic level, I'm saying, how they worked it out. They sunk their ships <laughs> and got the money out of insurance. <laughs> that is a typical uh, Greek style of behavior is that they know already, it's a, it's a kind of a wisdom. They know that how far to go. Like we can see now, Onassis also married this mad woman, Kennedy's wife, because he must have realized that Kennedy never gave her any security, so he married her. All right. He married her up to a point, but most of his property went to his daughter not to Mrs. Kennedy. This balance and this wisdom is a special Greek style of life. That's why you might say that they are not overdeveloped like Americans are. But now Americans are realized that they are idiots, but Greeks can never become idiots, whatever you may try. <laughs> they are very sharp and very intelligent, but they know how far to go with everything. Or uh, what is the reason for this, the Athena? <coughs> so Athena is the one Adi Shakti and she created Ganesha here and the balance of the universe or all the dharmas is in the Nabi Chakra and so the people over here are very balanced. You can find them uh, very <coughs> in their language, in their styles, very deep. 
One may say because they are traditional people, they have long traditions. But Egypt had also long tradition. Of course, Egyptians are, in a way, wiser than all other Islamic countries, but not like Greeks, not like Greeks. We have Chinese also who are very wise, and uh, they are known to be people of deep understanding, but they are not like Indians. So what is lacking in all these people is the depth of awareness, because though in <coughs> China also Mother of Mercy came and she really uh, bestowed blessings upon them, and China rose also afterwards into her own glory and became quite a good industrial, I mean developed country we can say, very powerful. But still that kind of regimentation could not be born because after all Mother Mercy was there. Do you know last, you have one Mother Mercy you to give, you given me, one, uh, well, Kuanin, same thing, Kuanin, and she's the same thing called as Mother of Mercy. And the second one was given by Gregor recently. And you see what's happening in China now. So the effects of these deities which existed in different countries at different times are felt only in Kali Yuga in the best way. Now you may say that why should Mother come last to Greece? Because now Athena is in the Sastrana. So you have to go not in the Nabi. So I had to bring Sastrana here, isn't it? Sastrara is the last chakra one has to achieve. So I thought that let Greeks grow up to the Sastrara point. So we have to establish Sastrara in this. And thus it's a very powerful work we have to do in Greece. Because actually at the time when Athena came here, it was not Sastrara, it was Nabi, because she was actually on the Himalayas, came from Himalayas. So now to bring Himalaya here or to bring that purity in Greece is a tremendous task. And we have very few Sajogis. But you see the reaction of the gentleman who came, and we have formidable job because of these uh, orthodox, most unorthodox. <laughs> they have no orthodoxy about anything. So we have a problem, big problem, how we will establish here. The <coughs> Devaloka was formed yeah, and Devas were here, they rule here, no doubt. But in the human awareness they were brought down to the human level. Like Zeus was Parshurama, Parshurama, the one who was an incarnation to announce the advent of Sri Rama. And he came before Sri Ram died also very much before Sri Ram. But they painted Zeus as a man who was a womanizer. So all gods were brought to the level of human beings, with, restored with all the weaknesses, see, actually decorated with all the weaknesses, <laughs> like that. And that is responsible for the downfall, because 
this part of the country is on the pattern of Devaloka, reflection of that. But this Devaloka is now, we see is, has become just the opposite, because deities have been brought down to such a low level, to such degrading <coughs> Even the mythology also in India talks about them like this, not to such an extent, like Zeus they don't talk, but about Indra they talk. And uh, like Indra's description comes like this, that the king Hiranyakashapu's wife was living, his wife Hiranyakashapu's wife was a saintly lady and Hiranyakashapu was ruling in the area of um, you can say Kandahar and Afghanistan and all these places and from here Indra went down and took away the wife I mean, they incarnated, the gods incarnated here. And Indra went down, took away the wife of Hiranyakashapu with him to save her. And he went down and stayed in an ashram in Maharashtra, where there's a river flowing with my name, Neera. <laughs> so the, now see the, how the combinations are. The Shandilya Muni, who was the guru of my family, that's why my gotra is Shandilya, it was in his ashram he stayed. So the Muni Shandilya told that, see, this lady is a very pure lady, don't disturb her, and out of her will come a very great saint who will, by his own devotion, make the incarnation of Narasimha. You see the God uh, Vishnu which comes as the <coughs> half head. And he will kill this Asura. Now part of the Egypt was also ruled by the Siranakasham, part of the Egypt. See the, how significant everything is. So this Narasimha came when you know about Prahlada's story, all right. So this little boy played there around and he made some s things and there's a temple very near. You have seen Narasimha's temple? Narasimha, And that, you have seen the statue made out of sand? Yes. That was made by Prahlad. And he came into the dreams of someone and said that, in your temple you please put the statue I have made. And they went round the Nira river and found it and put it there. So see the relationship, how it is. Now this Hiranyakashapu was killed by Narasimha. Narasimha, as you know, is the incarnation of Sri Vishnu. Because he had, the Hiranyakashapu had a blessing of Brahmadeva that not any animal can kill him, not any human being can kill him, not on the land or in the sky, and not with any weapon, all so many blessings he had taken. He had closed all the lines, see, so that nobody should kill him. But actually he did not know there are ways and methods. So Sri Vishnu took the form of Narasimha, is that he became the Simha, means the lion, and the lower portion of a man. And it so happened that 
Hiranakeshapu asked Prahlada, where is your God? He said, this is everywhere. So he said, all right, is he in this uh, pillar? He said, yes, he is in this pillar also. So he hit the pillar. See, the pillar must have been the same style as you make, Greek style, pillar of stone. <laughs> so he knew that in the pillar how can anybody be? It's a stone. He hit it, but the pillar broke, out of which came out Narasimha with long hands and claws. And he took that Hiranyakshapu and put him on his lap, because neither on the sky nor in the ground. <laughs> and with his claws, because they were not weapons, he opened his stomach and killed him. So because he was also ruling in Egypt, the people of Egypt made the they were As Assyrians. Assyrians are Asuras. They were not, they were the ones who were Asuras. That's why they are called Assyrians. So they made the statue of their god Sphinx the other way round than Narasimha. So the upper part of the Sphinx is that of man and the lower part of uh, that statue is that of light. This is very ancient story I'm telling you. So how the Greeks went to India long time back, because all these devas were Greeks. And these devas were like Indra, what he did, then Varuna and all these things. But I think the, because the whole idea got perverted, whole thing, they could not see the proper image of their, uh, of their faces in their meditation, because they perverted them, so they could not see, they saw perverted faces, they saw them nude and that kind of thing which was all their own imagination working, because they were indulging into all kinds of immoral things, so they made it absolutely <coughs> what you call a very immoral type of uh, relationships and things among them. So that was their own ideas and they put it. But also as a result of that they could never see the body or the faces of these devatas properly. So they made them more like, um, I mean quite ugly looking faces they made. Like I saw Pasidon they have made here, which they gave it to my husband also. It's not at all like Varuna, I can tell you. So, and absolutely nude, you know, it's so embarrassing. They gave it to my husband and he didn't know where to look and I just started <laughs> laughing because he's a very shy man, <laughs> my husband. And he had to put it in his office, you see, hidden somewhere and it looks very funny. <laughs> and he was saying, why not we use a kind of a... Uh, covering with some silver. I said, it's an antique they have reproduced. You can't do it to an antique. I said, all right, where should I put it? I said, put it in some corner. <laughs> so with such expense they gave it, but my husband was quite upset about it, you see. <laughs> Every time he sees this gentleman, he says, you know, this gentleman is no good. <laughs> all right. So then this uh, part of the history is there. On that history stands the modern Greek. So if you see from Socrates to Christ, people had evolved, we think, but they also crucified Christ. So what was their evolution? Though if you see what Christ preached and what I'm sorry, what Christ preached and Socrates preached, 
there is much difference because Socrates talked in parables, not openly. While Socrates talked in a very open way, in an open discussion, in an open understanding, that shows only that the people could understand what he was saying. But still, he was also killed. Socrates also was given poison and he was also killed. So that shows that at that time also the people in charge or at the helm of affairs did know what was reality. So now from Christ to Socrates and from Socrates to me, we can say this way that we are talking about it. Though Socrates came uh, in the year, how much BC he was? Uh, about 500 years before Christ. Christ. 500 before Christ. So might be that Christ must have felt that Socrates, he talked so openly, so nicely to people as because he was primordial master. He realized it. So he talked in parables. He thought that no use talking straight like Socrates. Because, you see, they are very straightforward people. The primordial masters have to be very, very, they are by nature extremely straightforward. Uh, even today's, those who, are re those who were real gurus, they would not accept any uh, person, they would throw away, they would beat people. Uh, even musicians in India, those who are great masters, they would beat their disciples if they played something wrong, like very harsh people. So it was all right for Socrates also to tell things very plain and simple and all that, but still he was killed. And then Christ, who was 500 years later, came. See, he saw the point that no use talking, because he came at Agya, talking in that way. If you tell somebody, don't do like this, even reason it out like Socrates did, he is the master of logic, you can call it. The whole logic system comes from him. He is a master of logic, but despite that it did not appeal to the logic of the people who were at the helm of affairs. So they have no logic in their heads, you see, they are just rationalist. Rationality is blindness, but there is no logic. So because there is no logic, they killed him and Christ understood that there is no logic with these people, so better talk to them in parables. So he talked to them in parables, but still they killed him. Help the, the authorities, they couldn't bear, they thought he's becoming very powerful or whatever it was. The Jews themselves were very funny and they did it. So in Sahaja Yoga, what I decided that at least I should give realization to people first. And then I can talk to them whatever I like. Now I'm talking to you everything and you are understanding it because you are realized souls. But I cannot talk this to an ordinary person. So we have two types of people, one who are Sajubis and one who are not. Of course there are some Sajubis who are not very worthy of this, I agree, and they may just go back or something. But you can become worthy of understanding all this knowledge because your Kundalini can make you so capable and your Sastra are so good that you can absorb what I am saying and can logically see what I am saying is true. And you can also verify it whether it is true or not. So this stage of yours I think is the highest stage of awareness where collectively you are understanding. The situation is not so bad as it was even at the time of Christ. Before that of Socrates' time I think he was the only wise man going around. There was nobody else seems to be have any wisdom, even his disciples you see, like Plato, he went off his head. Then Aristotle went off his head. I, both of them really were, tried to have their own arbitrary additions, <laughs> which were all absolutely. 
but he talked absolutely Socrates talked absolutely about gods and everything and talked so openly then in the same way we can say the primordial master state is that we have Muhammad Shah. he was also killed he was also killed because he told the truth then came Nanaka. He was not killed but nobody bothered about him. And the people who really follow him are just in the opposite direction. Supposing he was saying, come this way, so they are going in that way. <laughs> you find even same thing with Christ. If Christ said, come this way, the Christians are going that way. Every religion is just the same. Same with Krishna's Gita. Those who preach Gita are just... If Krishna is standing here and saying, come this way, Gita is saying, they are preaching Gita, going down, taking people down. So it is common with all religions that they have always used the name of prophets and of all the incarnations just to make money and to take everybody to hell, straight forward march to hell. See, so, now those who are alert about it and those who have seen it, that this is all nonsense, are in Sahaja Yoga. And Sahaja Yogis can't do that because they have come quite a long way now on this side. So they are going to pull out many others to that side instead of going themselves down. So this is the situation today and that's why I say Greece is a very wonderful area where we can work it out. If Athena could be awakened here, this place could be of very great help to us. Now there are very balanced Greek people, they have great sense of art because of right side Swadhisthana. Also they have lots of qualities of uh, understanding the uh, worthlessness of too much uh, indulgences and all that. It is so. But the immorality grew now because they started copying Westerners. Otherwise the women here were very moral women. Right? This is only in these twenty years this change has come. Before that the women were very moral, very good women lived here. And some of them are now in India, as I told you, they came with Alexander. And they were very good husbands and wives and very good families. This is only, I don't know why, about twenty years or twenty-five years at the most you can say. The Kali Yuga is showing its effects here also. But it's a very solid country and still they respect, respect a woman who has character respect her. They may use a woman who has no character, but they respect the woman who has character and also respect the mother. So there are lots of qualities in this country which are still existing in some places lingering and some places effective. So the job of Sahaja Yogi is, is to somehow or other evoke that integrating force in them of the Athena, and I'm sure we can purify this country. May God bless you. <coughs> Alexander was 200 before Christ, or 100, 200 before Christ, I think. He was a, he was very much respected in India, always. Alexander was very much respected in India and because he went away, you see, and he didn't take away anything from India. 
like any other invaders who came, you see, just looted us. He did not. I think he got quite detached after coming to India. Anybody who is, who has come to invade India and has really gained something out of the spirituality of India was Alexander. Otherwise the English lived for 300 in India, 300 years. Nothing went into their heads, nothing. 300 years, can you believe it? They used to laugh at everything, they used to make fun of everything. Nothing went into their heads. But so many Greeks stayed on because they liked India very much. So they stayed back. They wouldn't come back. So many are there, even now, living in the forest. So, this is something, is the sensitivity, the awareness, which has grown through times in the Greek people. You can see the character of Alexander, how he was. There's a poet in India called Chandavardai, who was at the time of Alexander. Alexander brought him here, honored him, kept him here. He was here and he wrote poems about Alexander, about his greatness and things, praised him so much. I mean, I can't think of English people carrying any Indian as a poet to England. It's no question. I mean, they didn't know. And the sign of awareness is this, that you don't respect anybody else. You say, ah, oh, I am the greatest. Then you cannot see the goodness of other people. Same with Portuguese. Of course, Vasco de Gama was a simple man. Because when he came first to India, he saw Indians and he, he went to Goa and he saw the temple of the goddess there, is the Shanta Durgas. So went back and told his king that they are all Christians because they follow the mother. They are not Muslims. <laughs> so simply was. There is no need to trans, uh, uh, make them Christians. They are already Christians because they follow mother. <laughs> he was a nice man. But Portuguese also never learnt anything. Uh, much, but still certain respect they showed, like um, the name of Bombay is Mumbai. They still call it Mumbai. Many words, Mumbai, is the Mumba, Mumbai, Mumbai is the name. Means she is the mother of Mumba, like I is the mother. So they call it Mumbai, is the name of the goddess. So they didn't want to change it. And then in Portugal when I went they were saying Mumbai. So I said, why do you call it Mumbai? They said, of course, all it's the name of the goddess, isn't it? I said, it is. But the English came, called it Bombay, finished. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see the, you see the awareness, it's, you can see the awareness of people. Because they were so aware about the serenity, about the holiness, about the auspiciousness and all that. So they said, how can we call it Bombay because it is the name of the Goddess. Just think the depth, you know, we cannot call. But in English could have gone and found out what is this place called, why is it called Mumbai. But they did not. But even if they had found, I don't think they would have kept it as Mumbai. They would not have. Because, you see, that respect for serenity and all these things, Somehow or rather in this, people who ruled us, it was not there. Now, the children of Briti, uh, Britain are very different, very different. But those who ruled us had no respect at all. They would only go to church, and I don't know what, and nothing, no respect. While the Greeks had always respect for Indians, they came with respect. Now the respect also is a card, a kind of an awareness within us. And now as the time has passed, I find Britishers have respect for others. They are respecting. Many. I mean, I would not say all, but quite a lot. Isn't it weird what you say? <laughs> he has not met any <laughs> I haven't seen so many lately. Huh? I haven't seen so many lately. <laughs> Yes, that's the part res uh, lacking, respect. That is the part lacking in England. And imagine in the heart, if there is no respect, then what sort of a heart it must be? The whole world can get ruined by that heart.
So that's the thing one has to uh, one has to create respect, respecting others, uh, respecting their culture, respecting their lifestyle. But uh, I mean, whatever you may say, but theoretically it is there. May not be in practice. Theoretically, it is working because you are not supposed to insult anybody who is from the ethnic group and all that is there legally, theoretically. But in practice it is not, I agree, but theoretically it is working. You can't insult somebody because he is a black man or he is a ethnic group, you cannot, under law you cannot do it. So that is there, but that's theory, but still awareness-wise also people are aware. I know of so many of them who were sitting in the sun and fasting for South Africa. So between the South African awareness and British awareness, we must say, we should be proud that in British awareness there is lot of sense. And that sense, once it comes to the point of respecting others, I think it can transform the whole world. But I don't know how I have to do it. I've tried. It has to be respect. It is not insulting now, but it is not positive respect. So one has to learn how to positively respect. At least surgeries must be positively respected. This is what I've been talking about about Buddha, about truth, about respect. But once you know that they are Sahajogis, one has to respect. And this one has to learn from the Greeks, because still they have a sense of respect. They know how to respect, isn't it? That part is there. <laughs> that one has to learn. Even the Egyptians are and also the Chinese, because out of all these years of traditional growth they have realized one thing, that if you have to really exist in this world, you have to learn how to respect others. And respect is something from your heart, like the Japanese have no respect for anyone, but they'll go and bow ten times don't know when to stop. If they bow, and if you bow, they'll go on permanently. <laughs> so it's best is you stop. But it's artificial, it's not real. So it should come from, from your innate being to respect others. And when that works out, then your awareness has definitely reached a very high state, high state of uh, uh, understanding of divinity. So then you come to a point of respecting the Adi Shakti. And there when you have respect, it's not artificial respect. It's not artificial, it should be from your heart. And once you start doing that, your awareness will improve. And that is not what you get, it's not what you have, but what you give to yourself by respecting. And this respect is will transform you completely, I can tell you, because there's a big understanding now between you and the Divine, and I'm sure everything will work out very well. The way the deities respect Dadi Shakti, if you also learn that respect, then things will work out. And I think Greeks will lead us very well, the whole of Europe in this respect, I'm sure about it. May God bless you. I have some water.